Morning, everybody. Um, I was thrilled and flattered to, to receive a phone call from Juan and the Grimaldo group about a month ago asking me to speak here today, and I'm happy to be with you all. A packed house. I'm glad you all came. Hopefully you, you learned something and, uh, and then take away a few things, and uh, hats off to the, uh, the presenters who have already shared their, their, their wisdom and knowledge. I'm going to piggyback a lot off of what you've already learned from them as it applies. Next slide. All right, a bit of an introduction. I'm from Arizona. I was born here in Mesa 38 years ago. Um, I spent four years in the Marine Corps. I have two kids. I've been married to my wife, Sonia, for 17 years. Um, just so you'll have a little bit of context for age and demographic and, and, uh, and, and origin, if you will. Uh, next slide. Why am I here? I've earned multiple degrees in business management. My career is in organizational leadership, specifically in higher education. I'm also an adjunct faculty member. I teach business. The reason Juan called me is because I don't work in real estate. I'm not a real estate professional. I'm not a loan officer. I'm not a real estate agent. I've, I don't, I've never had a real estate license. I don't buy and sell homes professionally. Um, but somehow I own 11 of them. And that is what Juan wanted me to share with you all today how I did it and sort of my thinking and my mindset that kind of what led my wife and I to, to, to where we are today and hopefully where we go from here. I, I've inherited nothing. I put that in there. My, that's a weird thing to say, right? I hear that a lot. He must have inherited something. It's not true. All my parents and grandparents are still alive and I don't stand to inherit much anyway, so... I just wanted to throw that out there. It's kind of a misconception, I find. A lot of folks have, have mentioned that to me when they hear bits and pieces of my story. And uh, just wanted to throw it out there for context. Next slide. All right, so I'm used to walking around and teaching a class. I apologize. I'm kind of stuck here. I like that. All right, uh, so you hear Instagram reels and commercials on television, five steps for financial success, a guaranteed, blah, blah, blah. I don't have any scientific formulas, y'all. My story is a personal experience story. It's how I got here. It won't look the same. If anybody else does it, it'll look a little different, hopefully with the same outcomes. I just want to disclaim that a little bit because I'm not one of those people that, that just assumes that everyone can do it just because I did. It's going to look different going to feel different. The houses will be different. The land will be different. The people involved will be different. Not everyone's story is the same. Yeah, some, some, exactly. <laughs> Married, single, children, no children, male, female, whatever the case might be. So please don't take any of my story as scientific fact or a turn-by-turn -turn roadmap. That's not what it is. It's just my experience, and hopefully you all gain something from that. And think about what you've already learned based on insurance, and loan rates, and different mortgage programs, and even buying and selling with the Grimaldo Group, if you choose to, how that fit into my story and how it might fit into yours. So I'm glad that Juan called out mindset. That's what I'm going to focus on. That's where I think the lessons are. Mindset, belief structure, if you will, your relationship with money that was already, that was already talked about. I think that's very important because, like I said, your story is going to look different. But as long as your mindset is proper, then, uh, then, then you can be uh, uh, you know, as successful as, as possible, as it takes you. Um, and mindset changes over time. It certainly has for me. So I'll get into that as well. So without further ado, my story. Why am I here? I lied. A little bit more ado. <laughs> I'm talking today about real wealth. What is real wealth? In my mind, it's net worth. What is net worth? Total assets, all combined. Minus total liabilities. Whatever's left over is your net worth. If you got a $100,000 Lamborghini with a $100,000 car loan, how much is your net worth? Zero. I like Lamborghinis, by the way. But the point remains, that's not real wealth. If you own a Lexus with no car loan, it's paid for, that's wealth. But if you got a $50,000 car loan on that car, it's not real wealth. It looks nice, it's fast. It's not what my goal is. There's nothing wrong with Rolex and Armani shoes. I want both of those things one day. 
But if you get those things with $25,000 in credit card debt, that's not real wealth. It looks nice. It's not real wealth. Real wealth isn't a home with a pool, and you've got one mortgage, you've got a second mortgage, you've got a home equity line of credit, and you've got four other loans borrowed against your home. That's not real wealth. Real wealth is a home with a pool that you own outright, and there ain't no mortgages, and there's no loans borrowed against it. That's real wealth. That's my goal. That's my wife and I's goal. That's what our story is about, growing real wealth. Net worth, in my opinion, is the only measuring stick that really matters. You can have other things that are also goals of yours. Eliminate debt. Um, you know, uh, cash flow on a monthly basis. Any number of things can be additional goals uh, in your real estate sort of ambition or story, if you will. My wife and I decided that net worth was going to be the only point that we focus on because not every month is a good month. Not every year is a good year. And you'll lose money from time to time. It sucks. So I'm going I'm to talk about mindset and talk about net worth because that really exemplifies the long game. I'm going to talk about uh, you know, keeping the goals in mind and uh, really, really just understanding that Missing the forest for the trees can happen in any walk of life, and it can certainly happen if you're trying to invest, invest in real estate. And when the air conditioning and one of the rentals fails and you're out $10,000, that sucks. And it makes you not want to do this anymore because you're out of pocket for that ten grand. you You're the owner, not the renter, you. But that particular property has appreciated $100,000 over the past four years. So am I really in the red? I'll get into it. Okay, now without further ado. It's 2007. I've been home from the Marines for about three minutes. My wife and I knew we wanted to buy a home when I got home. I got back from my last deployment. It was about eight months long. While I was on deployment, my wife and I really, really pinched every penny, and we saved every dollar we could because we knew we wanted a house when I got home, and that's what we did. $12,000 was our down payment, FHA loan, where Sergio, shout out to FHA loans, it's a great deal. PMI, because we didn't have 20% down, bummer. Didn't quite make it. It's all right, first time home buyers. It was all right, it's all right, it's all right. Saved up, and we moved in. Yay, happy. Six months later, You'll notice the year, some things changed in the housing market. And we started to hear this horrible thing called being underwater. Did some quick Googling, and sure enough, we were very underwater. And if you don't know, that means you, you, your asset is worth less than you owe on it at the time. It's very frightening. It's very off-putting. And uh, we were so, we, we were very underwater. Hundreds of thousands of people were underwater, including us. We were so far underwater, we were finding Nemo, I swear to God. <laughs> I, and, and, and it was very off-putting, and at the time, we wondered, did we make a mistake? A dozen of our friends walked away. If you don't know what that means, it means they just left, rented an apartment, moved in, let their home go to foreclosure, ruined their credit score. I knew I was underwater, but I didn't feel like ruining my credit score was worth it. I felt like I'd I felt like we'd be okay. We were employed. We hadn't lost our jobs, thankfully. So we could still make the mortgage payment. Why would we walk away, just ruin our credit, move into an apartment, and four or five years later, our credit has rebounded, and we try to start again just to be back to where we were then. I know the market was shitty, but, excuse me, I'm Marine Corps. Um, but that's just numbers on a spreadsheet. We can make the payment. We like our house. We just moved in. Why would we walk away? despite what experts suggested. Why would you pay money? I had, I had a friend in particular, I still, I still, we're still in touch today, and he said, you should walk away. Why would you pay money into a loan, my, our mortgage, for an asset that is worth less than what you owe? And I was like, ain't that what you're doing with your car right now? He hadn't thought of that before. Good guy, though. Great guy. All right. We're underwater. A year later, we're walking through the neighborhood. There's a whole bunch of empty lots because builders can't give houses away. This is 2008. So just out of curiosity, we wander into the model homes and talk to the sales agent, and we walk out with, next slide, Maria. 
contract to build this. It was three, door, it was three, three streets down. This is house number two. Great incentives because, like I just mentioned, it's 2008 and builders can't give houses away. But it's bigger, uh, more bedrooms. We had been saving our money uh, all that year because we were, you know, it's 2008. We were afraid that someone might lose our job. We were already in the habit of saving our money from when I was deployed. So we were saving our money anyway just in case we wanted a nest egg. And so we had a little bit in the bank. And this was going to take a year to build. And in that time, we figured we could get the rest of the necessary down payment to get up to, well, as much as we could. This was a conventional loan. We already had an FHA loan. At the time, we, we couldn't get a second one because we already had a home. So we had to do conventional lending. I didn't quite make it to that 20% threshold, so we had PMI. And we moved in. So what do you do with the other house? What do you do with house number one? You can't sell it. You're underwater. Well, gosh, honey. Maybe we could try to rent it. So we did. And it rented fast. And all of a sudden, it's 2009. We're 24 years old, and we have two houses. And we made a joke to each other. Ha ha, hey, babe, at this rate, we'll have 10 by 40. It was a joke. We didn't believe it. A year later, my wife's driving home, and she passes yet another builder a mile up the road from where we were, from this house. There's a big old sign, brand new houses, $125,000. We can't give these things away. Please buy them. Next slide. So we did. We saved up. We never got out of that habit. We didn't buy all of our homes just by saving up the down payment every time, but we did most of them, and you'll see that. The house was super cheap. This is 2010 at this point. The market is still super scary. People are still walking away. People who are renting are happy about the fact they're renting because the market's scary. You'll, you'll notice something as I go on. We tend, my wife and I tended to do the opposite of what everyone else was doing. That's terrifying. I don't necessarily recommend that, but for us it worked, okay? Because you're right. How old are we now? We're 25. This is house number three. No one we knew in our peer group had a home. Uh, most of them don't today. Uh, the folks we hung out with. What we were doing was not only foreign to people we shared this with, but it was, it was almost alien. Anyway, we bought it as a rental, we never moved in. That's a, that's, a, that's a difference. We moved into the first two and lived there personally and just rented the one behind us when we left. That's not what we did here. We're like, all right, well, we never tried this before. Let's see if it works. It did. Rental markets, despite what the real estate uh, market might be doing, you know, buyer's market, seller's market, whatever, the rental market seems to be very, very constant and steady. At least that's been our experience. It rented. We never moved in. We stayed in house number two uh, buying this. Okay. Habits and mindset real quick before I move on. We didn't know when the next opportunity would present itself. We just assumed it would, and we wanted to be ready when it did. So we saved our money. We lived beneath our means on purpose. During these first two or three years, uh, I, I, I received a promotion uh, and even got a bonus at one point. They did away with those, but, uh, but at one point. And it would have been very easy to upgrade our lifestyle up to the limit of our income. We did not do that. We took that extra cash. We kept our lifestyle the same. We took the extra, and we just stashed it, thereby making our already uh, positive habit of saving our money every month easier and faster because there was more being saved every month. You know, groceries, thankfully, didn't cost that much different than they had over that time period, and you know, car insurance stayed kind of the same, and, you know, and so we were able to save more. What year is it? It's 2010. 2013, one such opportunity arose. We kind of cooled it for a second. We were like, oh my God, we got three houses. What are we doing? Uh, how old are we? And 
But in 2013, an opportunity presented itself, and we jumped on it. And we were ready to do that because we were saving our money because we knew we wanted to be ready. Not because we knew what the next opportunity would be. It's okay if you don't know. We didn't know. I don't know today what the next opportunity will be. But I know that I want to be ready for it, and we were. Next slide. This thing was kind of a monster. Um, my parents were selling their home. This thing. And I was like, hey, I've got an idea, because I have three houses and I know what I'm doing. <laughs> Sell it to me. Skip the, uh, skip the realtors, keep all the equity. No offense to the Grimaldo group. Uh, <laughs> s skip the agents. We'll march down to the title agency. Sell it to me. I'll get funding. Don't worry about it. Called up a couple lenders, found some funding. My parents were on board. We bought it. We moved in. It had a pool, it's 3,500 square feet. Uh, it's kind of, it, was, it was a former model home, it was gorgeous. It's kind of a monster, honestly. We didn't think we would ever leave house number two, but here we were again, moving into house number four. We weren't underwater anymore with house number two, thankfully. It's 2013 at this point, Mark, it's doing a little better. We weren't underwater, so we could have sold house number two. Nah, we got two other rentals. Let's keep this thing going. Turn it into a rental, it rented, it's still rented to this day, and uh, we moved into house number four. A year later, we needed to move. My wife had a very lucrative internship opportunity for her doctorate degree in Avondale. Oh, before I, question in the back. Um, was your home in Avondale? Yes, it was. Yes, they do. And I wouldn't have qualified for that if they didn't. Yes, Th that is key. If you're trying to grow your rental fleet and one or two of them are empty, it's going to be tough. Yes, because I, I, as much as we had a down payment, I didn't have, um, it was conventional. It was going to be conventional anyway because I still already had that, that FHA loan on house number one. And that was still there. So I couldn't get another one, so it had to be conventional. Unfortunately, I didn't get the 20% threshold to eliminate PMI, but yeah. I believe so. I would defer to my friends over a guaranteed rate for that question. That's why, you, uh, that's why you have friends in the industry. Ask them questions. All right. So we needed to move to Avondale because that would have been a hell of a commute from Gilbert. And we found, next slide, what would have been house number five, but it got away. Long story short, we found this online. It fits our needs. It's small. It's cheap. We like it. We've done this before a few times. What's the difference? Should be easy. We smash that button on the, on, the, on, the, on the website that says contact agent, and lo and behold, Juan Grimaldo picks up the phone and contacts us. That's how the first time I met, I met Juan and the Grimaldo group, what would become the Grimaldo group. I made a mistake. I went back to the same lender that gave us the cash for the big house, house number four, and for whatever reason, they kind of gave me the runaround and they didn't buy it. We told them we were moving to Levine into 1,200 square feet, no yard, no pool. And they said, well, what the hell are you doing with the 3,500 square foot pool and yard in Gilbert? It's like, we're going to turn it into a rental. I'm like, sure you are. That's me surmising what they thought. That's not exactly what they said. In any case, the loan was denied. Never felt this way before. We... And in retrospect, this is one of those lessons that you probably should have gone with a different lender and you probably should have worked slower. Because we rented house number four out from under us, forced us to quickly find a place to rent and move into in Tolleson. Here, nearby, 83rd Avenue. 
If I had it to do over again, I would have called up a different lender, one that had no history with me and didn't, didn't have any reason to doubt what I was saying, which I think is what was going on there. All right, so we told Juan, thanks, but no thanks. We bailed. Couldn't do business. Couldn't do business. Bummer. Probably should have called Sergio. Yeah. <laughs> so we found a place in Tolleson. We rented it. We moved in, and I hated every moment of it. But you do what you got to do. House number four was rented already, and the tenants were moving in next week. Got to go. Threw everything in a U-Haul and bailed. Tolleson's not that bad, actually. I like it. Next. Hated every moment of renting that house, but means to an end, right? House number five, what finally became house number five is in South Phoenix. It's on uh, Dobbins and 7th Street up against South Mountain. Great little community. Bought this house for this much money in 2015. For the first time ever, I used the VA loan. I'd never used that before. Eh, let's see what this is all about. I'm a vet. I qualify. Let's see what's going on. That's not bad. It was a good loan. I liked it. I liked it a lot. We didn't need a huge down payment, as Sergio will tell you. VA loans, if you qualify for that, allow for very, very little down payment, if any, in some cases. So all of that money we had been saving every month, which we were still doing, never got out of that habit, wasn't necessary to buy house number five. So we kept a lot of it and just put 15 grand down. And we moved in, got out of that rental. It was an okay rental, it was all right. All right, so where are we at now? This is house number five, it's 2015, we're 30 years old. My wife and I look at each other like, hey, remember that joke from a few years ago? Might be possible. Nah. Next slide. We've lived there for three years. Ooh. Mixing things up. Didn't do anything for three years. Kind of cooled it. Sat on that pile of money in the bank that, uh, that we were gonna use for down payments. Again, not knowing what opportunity might present itself in the future but interested to see where it goes. We ended up using that for something different. I'll get to that. We wanted more, but house number four was huge and it was a, not a great rental. Um, you needed to be like a family of five or six to justify living in that house, quite honestly. You had to be like a, you know, a doctor or a lawyer to afford the rent payment. It stood empty for several months at a time. It was not cool. We need to get rid of this rental. Hey, I know a realtor. We called up Juan and said, hey, remember us from a couple years ago? Great. We have a big house in Gilbert we want to sell. They sold it for us. We did well. That was the house that my parents used to own. Uh, it had been a rental for four years at this point, and we sold it. And with that money, we paid far too much in capital gains. Shout out to 1031 exchanges. Didn't do it. Should have. Another lesson learned. $25,000 in capital gains tax. I hate the government so much. <laughs> <laughs> but with the remaining profits, of which, which were substantial, we purchased house number six. And if that wasn't enough, next slide, we purchased also house number seven. In a single year, I sold a house and bought two more and finished my doctorate degree. If 2018 was a big year. 20% down, um, and you'll see here, we sold house number four to purchase house number six and seven. So you don't always have to save up all your money. Sometimes there's different ways of doing things. And that's not even all of them. There's a third way, which I'm about to get to. We moved in. We didn't move into house number six. That was a perfect rental. Small, three bedroom, two bath, right there in Phoenix on, uh, on Baseline Road. Uh, great rental. Rented it right away. Never moved in. But we moved into this one. And we turned house number five into a rental once again, leaving the house we lived in to turn it into a rental when we moved. Uh, that's 2018. We sold one to buy two. At this point, we have six. Next slide. A year later, we look in Santan Valley. We realize there's some deals out there, so we swipe one with that money that I told you we had saved up but didn't use to buy six and seven, we used to buy eight. Saved up for the 20%, and as you can see here, uh, avoided PMI, because we had 20%, that was pretty cool. And uh, this was another rental, we never moved in. Great little place. Butts up against golf course down in uh, Johnson Ranch in Santan Valley, very cool. We are, how old are we? We're 34, that's seven. 
suddenly our joke isn't a joke. And we looked at each other and we said, well, how can we actually pull that off? 10 by 40. And we got a little, we got a little crazy coming up. So next slide. House number nine is a brand new construction. We built it. Um, my wife wanted a new house. The house we were living in, house seven, was built in the early 80s. And it was a little dated, let's be real. Beautiful, but dated. Wife wanted a new house. And uh, our first child was on the way, finally. Uh, had this built. It took a year. It took more than a year because hashtag COVID. And uh, we didn't save up a bunch of cash. Well, we did, but we didn't use it for the down payment. We, we tried our hand at ref cash out refinancing existing properties because some of them, the older ones in particular, had a bunch of equity in them that we'd never looked at or really considered using. So we refinanced house number two, took out about $70,000 and used it. Three minutes, Christ. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to rock and roll. Conventional loan, no PMI, 20% down, we moved in. It's 2021. That's eight. Next slide. Later that year, we bought number 10. Now remember, that's nine, because we sold one. But this is house number 10, also Santan Valley, existing home. Uh, we refinanced house number five to get this one. Just like we had with house number two. Worked well, liked it. Good plan, good plan. Didn't take all the equity out, just took enough. Next slide. Till finally last year, our third Santan Valley home, we refinanced house number one, which we had never touched up to that point. If you're keeping track at home, that's 10, because we sold one, remember? We're 38. We made it. It wasn't a joke anymore. Kind of blew our mind a little bit, and we had to pause and reflect and think about what that meant, and really ask ourselves where we're going from here, but uh, hey, that can change. All right, next and final, not final slide, but next slide. All of this has culminated into what has become the goal. Acreage, lots of space, big house, lots of land, pool, big toy garage in the back, guest house, all of which will eventually have no mortgage, no monthly payment, and we'll raise our children. By the way, this is my father's home, and he'll live in the guest house. <laughs> and I'm not really getting the friends and family discount either, so eh, we'll make it work. In any case, we're selling a couple of the rentals in order to pull this off. That's all right, they're assets. Yeah, we made it to 10 by 38. That's cool. Let's sell a few and see what we can do with, with what we've done, with, with what we've made. That, to me, is the real wealth story thus far as I know it. So I want to touch on a few things that the story uh, sort of culminates in. Next slide. Oh, by the way, we have no idea what House 13 is going to look like. That remains to be seen. Okay. 10 by 40 was a joke. It turned into a reality, not because we had a comprehensive goal of finding a way to buy 10 houses. We just needed a plan to buy the next one. And that wasn't clear at the time. We didn't know what opportunity would present itself, but we knew that when opportunity knocked, we needed to be ready. And we were, and we still are today. Mindset, very important, as Juan has said. Just because a problem uh, answer solution isn't immediately obvious doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Be patient. Anything is possible. Nothing worthwhile ever came easy. There's going to be some setbacks. You might be underwater. You might have a loan denied. You might pay capital gains tax. <sighs> Still hate that. Rome wasn't built in the day. There's going to be setbacks. Learn from your mistakes. Live beneath your means. Sonia and I live beneath our means today. Very, very easy. I've been promoted like three times over the last decade and a half at work, all of which includes higher salary, higher responsibilities, higher bonus options. And at no point have we substantially adjusted our lifestyle. My Silverado is 17 years old, and I love that truck. I'm never selling it. Drove it here today. A air conditioning is cold. 
Above all else, folks, fortune favors the bold. Fortune doesn't tend to favor the meek, the mild, the cautious, and the timid. So Can you repeat that again? I love it. <laughs> fortune favors the bold, and that's more than just a silly expression. You can get lucky now and again by being cautious, but you can get consistently lucky by being bold. At least I have. Next slide. In conclusion, it doesn't matter if you're 22 years old like Sonia and I were, 41 years old like my brother-in-law was when he bought his second house, he now has three. Or 67 years old like my father-in-law who finally bought a second house. Basically mirroring Sonia and I's model in both cases. Doesn't matter how old you are, can I share, can I just jump in in that sure. section right there? What you guys are doing inspires people. And what we do, we don't do it to show off or to, we do it to inspire. Because at one point my wife's like, don't share all this stuff on Facebook. And I'm like, I don't do it to brag or say anything. I do it because I truly care. And I think that you inspire people when you do these things. Sure. Just speaking about your in-laws, they're getting inspired by you guys. They see sure. that it works. You follow the process and they're just following your footsteps. They really are, and, they're, and the, de the details are different. The down payments are different. The loans are different. The qualifications and the interest rates are different. The details are going to vary, but, but the model and having the courage to step out tends to work, and so my brother-in-law has three houses now, good for him, and uh, my father-in-law has two. doesn't matter if it's FHA lending or conventional or, or existing homes or new build or, or PMI, without PMI. It doesn't really matter. The details are going to change. That's why I say my story is not a scientific formula. And it's not a turn-by-turn -turn roadmap. It's just a mindset. And at the end of the day, as long as you are bold, you tend to make your own luck. At least thus far, that's what I've done. Awesome. That's all I've got. Well, don't go before. I, got one thing. <laughs> I want to just ask you a couple of things because the market changed while you were you were in the bad the worst market 2007 is when the market started to go down 2008 was a crash mm -hmm. he held on to those properties so one of the things that you guys need to understand is no matter what if you hold the property five ten years you think it'll come up afloat oh absolutely oh uh, house number one looked like a horrific mistake six months after we bought it i still own it today it wasn't a mistake awesome just an example there's other examples like that love it